Agents Podcast. Okay, Lab Coat Agents, welcome back to another episode of the Lab Coat Agents Podcast. And it is with great pleasure that I get to chat with a very good friend of mine in real estate uh, today. And we're going to share with you uh, some of her successes, how she has grown a massive team where this year they are on pace to do over 800 units for over 500 million in volume. And listen to this, in 2021, they are trending towards 1.2 billion with a B in volume. She is the founder of the Carrie Scholl team. She is the co-founder of Hyperfast Agent. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Ms. Mrs. Sorry, Carrie Scholl. Oh, <laughs> and let me add to that. She's got she is expecting her fourth child under the age of five. Carrie, <laughs> you are a beast. Welcome. Thanks, Jeff. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, so we were together last week, and this is kind of what sparked this idea to have her on the podcast, because Carrie and I have shared each other on each other's podcasts and talked at webinars. We belong to a mastermind together. Uh, we've got all kinds of things in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the oven currently, but what I wanted to share today was I was so impressed with, obviously, with her growth. That's just beyond impressive, and I want her to kind of give her backstory on kind of her meteoric rise, almost hockey stick curve type of rise, but also what she's doing uh, to nurture it and to maintain it and what she's built along the way. And what I witnessed last week was what they called a hyper fast summit. And we were just talking before the show about what she does with her coaching clients. Uh, but also I think that has a lot to do with the growth of her real estate team. So Carrie, let's start with you just kind of, let's assume some, some of our listeners don't know who you are. So tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of where you started, when you started and how, you know, like how this growth has happened. Sure. Um, so I got into the business in 2003, right out of college. And I think Jeff, I told you this story for the first time. I was really torn because I had the opportunity to be the Oscar Mayer wiener girl coming out of Penn State. Uh, or to go work for a new home sales builder. And both, I mean, there were pros and cons to both, but thank God I chose to get in the real estate industry. So from 2003 to 2008, I, I worked in new home sales in various capacities. I ended up managing sales teams that sold buildings for developers in the second half of that chunk. And um, in 2008, awesome timing, right? I decided... Uh, Quite, quite by accident, really. One of my mentors asked me to, to transition with her to the resale side to work with an investor that had 50, a $50 million check that he was willing to write to buy bulk short sales and foreclosures. So I'm like doing the math. Like, wow, that's a lot of money. This sounds like a great opportunity. Like I'm super pumped about this, right? Three weeks later, that guy bought a hotel with the $50 million and I woke up and I was like, holy crap, I am a real estate agent. I have to like go find a client. And I was coming from a background where everybody came to me in my new home sales center, right? So marketing was not a big focus in the early days of my real estate career. It was all about how to greet the client, how to get them excited, uh, the selling skills, which still... A lot of what I teach my coaching clients today is about how to actually sell the process, right? Mm -hmm. How to a step A, step B, step C. And I learned that foundational stuff um, when I first got out of college through the training program. But now fast forwarding from 2008. So I get in, I have zero clients. By the way, I live in Washington, DC where I don't have a network, right? So I, I transitioned right after college, I'm from Oregon. So, so when I say I didn't have a network, I mean, if you're in a position where you're thinking about moving, I talk to a lot of real estate agents that are like, moving is better for my family, but I know people here. So I have to stay. I'm like, no, it's not true. That's a limiting belief. If you're going to be happier somewhere else, like take the plunge and there's a way to build it fast. So that's where I was. I mean, I was kind of plopped in the middle of Arlington, um, in a time where the market wasn't great and just trying to figure out how to navigate it. Awesome. So this is 2008. So kind of what, what, were, what then happened the, the following years immediately following that? 
So I wasn't a rock star out of the gates. I mean, I had a good year. I did 19 transactions my first year. And my husband, in contrast, did 21 million his first year, right? <laughs> so when people get to know us, they're like, you know, Dan just like crushed it. He wrote a book about it, the hyper fast, a hyper local, hyper fast agent. And he talks about like the exact techniques. He was so strategic in how he grew. I was like, I'm really friendly. <laughs> um, I, I'm a connector and I'll work hard. But the early days of my business, man, I wish I had somebody who was willing to coach me that I found faster because I didn't start to really accelerate quickly until I hired a coach and put myself in the room with other people who were super successful. I, would, I hit 19 my first year. Imagine this. Talk about demotivating when I think about my growth now. Right. My second year, I did 21. So I did hey, two hey, transactions positive. more. You're going up. <laughs> yeah, but when you, I mean, now right. I'm like, I'm aiming for 100% growth, even at my size next year. And by the way, not that I'm counting exactly, I, I'm counting exactly. <laughs> We're at 800 transactions, 807, I think, ratified already this year. So our target this year is 1,000. Um, and it's going to be tight. It's going to be really, really tight. Um, but when, when I think about growth now, I'm always pushing for massive growth because that's exciting, right? And when you're growing and you're like, I was not feeling massively excited about my growth from 2008 to 2009, right? So um, the big game changer for me was I got a junk email and some of you can relate to this. So it was like, are you looking to make more money and create more time in your life? Which is like exactly what all of us are looking for, right? It was speaking to my heart and I took a leap of faith and I went to an event and the thing that changed, the content was great. It was, but for me, it wasn't about the content. It was about meeting people. I'm always, Jeff knows this and he's right there beside me. So none of you will judge us right now. <laughs> I'm always the one that's at the bar, the latest. Why? Well, because the people who are at the bar are people who are growing businesses that I can learn from their experience. I can learn from what's going well in their business and they'll share with you. They'll give you like, Hey, this ad's working for me. Take it. Right. People are so willing to share with you. So all of a sudden I'm in this room and I I'm meeting people who are doing 200, 300, 400 transactions. And I'm going, Oh my gosh, this is like a playground for me. Like I couldn't sleep. And I left that event and I said to myself, I'm going to grow a team. Like this is where it starts. Now I have this vision. Now I clarified what, what it was for me. And I'm not somebody who likes to be alone ever. Like I don't even like to pee alone. Honestly, I'm like, <laughs> who wants to come with me so I can talk while I'm peeing, right? So a team for me was about surrounding myself with really high quality people that had the same vision that I did and the same appetite for growth and ambition right? And being able as a team leader, one of the amazing things is you're handpicking those people. So if the, if the environment in your team isn't what you want, who is to blame? Yeah. It is you. You are 100% responsible for the environment you create and the people you allow to stay in that environment. And those people have a strong impact on everybody else. So I understood that really early on. And I think what happened from, from the year 2010, I hired my first assistant from 2010, all the way five years later, we did 365 transactions in the fifth year. So one transaction a day. And the reason that our growth was so massive is that we really focused on who, not how, yeah. right? And that's one of the principles we teach our coaching students. Like, when you're feeling overwhelmed, when your growth isn't where it needs to be, you need to take a hard look at how you're spending your time and reevaluate your priorities as the team leader and how to bring on the right talent to not just do the things you're doing, but to take your weaknesses and compensate for that and put the right people in place to really accelerate your growth and make you happier. Because the more you do what you're the best at and what is your strength that you bring to your team, the happier you're going to be, the more your hourly rate's going to go up. Everything is going to just click into place. And so that's what happened for us. And we just kept hiring. I love it. I love it. And I've got a couple of questions from that, 
from kind of what you just talked about. And the first one is this, the kind of how you ended it, which is it allows you to do what you love. Um, and you and I are kind of parallel, right? And I mortgage your real estate, but it took me a really long time to get out of the day to day and kind of realize what I love and what I'm good at, which has, is the reason why our business has, has just skyrocketed, right? Yeah. Uh, but but I, and I can, I can attest to this. So when, when you as the realtor, you're sitting there listening to this and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, I want to do that, but nobody does it as well as I do. I can't trust somebody to do my paperwork. I can't trust somebody to meet the client. I can't trust somebody to sit in the living room and trying to earn the, the listing. What would you say to somebody who's saying, because I know I said it, like, just let go, Jeff, let go. Other people can do it well, too. What is your advice to someone who just struggles to let go? Well, the first thing I would say is um, when you have that mindset, you need to put yourself in the room with people who have already done it successfully so that you say to yourself, well, wait a minute, I am not a unicorn. <laughs> I am not these people. Have, and, it, and hi, if you need to be in the room with somebody who's done it extremely successfully, come find Jeff or come find me. Because what will help you see is that your perception, your reality is false. Yeah, It is absolutely not true. But here's one mistake that I see agents make that will, without a doubt, prove their hypothesis, hypothesis correct. Okay. It's when you wait to hire until you're so desperate that anything with a heartbeat that walks in your office, you will say yes to. Then all of a sudden you hire somebody who is not the right person. They're either, and here's the people we're attracted to guys. They have the exact same personality as us. And then we give them all the things we don't want to do because we think, oh, Jeff and I will get along so well. But guess what? If I give Jeff all the things I'm not good at and Jeff and I are the same, is he going to be successful in his job? No, you're taking away all the things that he would be good at or that person that you're hiring would be good at. You're keeping those because that's what you're strong at. So avoid the mistake of hiring somebody who is like you. Also avoid the mistake of hiring anybody just because you're desperate. And that's a common one. And then here's a third one, which sometimes people don't think about. You cannot take somebody and pay them minimum wage and expect them to be a rock star mm -hmm. because the people who would take that opportunity are not rock stars. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So if you want somebody that is super talented, they have to be able to make a lot of money and you want to structure their comp plan so that if they help you increase the business and you're making a lot of money, there's a win-win. So when we hire what we call a partner agent for our team members, those people are going, their base is 40,000, but their opportunity is 75 to 100,000 in year one in the business, okay? Mm -hmm. And some people say, oh my God, I couldn't afford to pay that. Absolutely, you could not afford to pay that right now. But if you can afford $10,000, and follow my, my, my comment here. If you can afford $10,000, that's three months of the $40,000 wage. You should already have an ROI on your 10,000 after 90 days. Then you hockey stick because all of a sudden, if you structure it how I suggest you structure it based on the typical strengths and weaknesses of a real estate agent, you're plugging that person into the showings. How many of you would like to do a lot less showings? right? Mm -hmm. And don't tell me, but Carrie, I like the showings. So do I, I'm a people person. I love the showings, but guess what? Now I have three children, as Jeff said, under five and another one on the way. And so I cannot jump up like a pop tart every time somebody needs to see a house, right? That doesn't work in my life anymore. So imagine if you had the freedom of of picking the times, because that's what it really is. Once you can decide when you're taking on a new buyer appointment or a new listing appointment, you have a little bit of flexibility to schedule those things and you know they're happening. Showing a house in our market, if the house comes on the market and you're not there to see it immediately, mm -hmm. it is gone. So yeah. you don't have the opportunity to be saying, you know what? Today is the day that I plan to go to dinner with my family. So how about if we go see it on Thursday instead of tonight? No, 
then the house is gone and you're a shitty agent, right? That's just the reality of the market. So by being able to delegate that piece of the process to somebody who's your partner, it gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility and freedom. And it is worth every penny to have somebody who's talented enough to position you to close that deal, right? Mm -hmm. And home inspections, you plug them into home inspections, the final walkthrough, you're plugging them into that. So there are a lot of ways to automatically take a process, give it to your partner, help them be successful. And for you to start making a tremendous amount more money by just having more time to spend on dollar producing things. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I mean, that's a perfect answer to the, to the question. Cause I think a lot of people struggle with that, which is the perfect segue into, okay, fine. You helped me just overcome that. Now, where the hell do I start? Uh, is it an assistant? Is it a partner? Uh, is it a buyer's agent? What, what is it specifically? That, and I know there's probably not one size fits all answer here, but kind of what is your mindset or, or your strategy for that growth? Because, because, and by yes. the way, folks, Carrie has, again, something else I was very impressed with. And Carrie, I have a partner and she knows him, Sean. So when we left, I even told Sean, I'm like, you know, looking at Carrie's team and, and the, the size of it and the intricate nature of it, like there's so many different pieces of the puzzle and videographers and marketing specialists and all this stuff. And I was like, damn, like we got some catching up to do. Um, it was kind of my thought because I have a very, it's different businesses, right? But, but that was my mindset. And so I'm going to digress this thing back to day, you know, to day one, essentially. So Gary, I, I kind of want you to expand on what I just teased, which is the, the magnitude of your team, what all you have, what goes into that, but where does someone start? What is your suggestion to that question? Sure. Well, the first thing I'll say, if you have a coach that tells you first, you need to do a, then you need to do B, then you need to do C run. Because what that coach is saying is there's one way to grow this business. And that's actually something that almost made me leave the business. And I'll tell you my specific story. My coach told me early on the same coach, by the way, that put me in the room with all those successful people and helped me get my vision. But he said, the ISA role is the most important role on the team. And the one, the team leader will have to keep the longest. Okay, now I hated the ISA role. For those of you who don't know, it's the inside sales agent. So any incoming lead, the inside sales agent is responsible for answering. And so this particular coach wanted me to be that person. And he said, even, even when you have buyer's agents and listing agents, you're still the one answering the phone and delegating the business to them. That to me was like, acid in my soul. I'm like, no, but I like to go out and meet the people like, no, I don't want to do that. And so I remember I was like, just fighting it because I knew that that wasn't my strength, right? I knew that sitting at a desk wasn't something that I was going to do. Um, and so then I knew I would fail, right? And some of you have a coach that's telling you, okay, do this first and then do this. And you're thinking, oh my God, I'm better at that. Like some people, I like working with buyers better than listings. A lot of people don't know that about me because I, at the essence of myself, now I'm a super high D, like my disc has evolved over the years, but I just liked the connection. And on the buy side, you get more of that love and connection. And on the list side, you have to be willing to have the hard conversations to get it priced right. And the gratitude from them on the list side isn't the same. Well, why is that? Well, because they're the ones that are paying the commission, the buy side, they don't feel the pain of the commission. They just feel the love of you being there. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more gratitude in that side of it. And for some of you, you may not have ever thought about why you really like the buy side better, but everybody's telling you, go get a buyer's agent and let them do the whole buy side. And you go do the list side and your soul is like, no, I love the buyers. They love me. Right. Yeah. So I say all of this to say the very first exercise, anybody who's looking at day one, what do I want to do? It's very simple. You need to write a list of all of the things that you do in your week. And then you need to circle the things that you are a not good at, and be honest with yourself. If you're trying to convince yourself that you're the best person at writing contracts and half the time you miss shit, you're not telling the truth. You're just not good at it. If you're forgetting addendums, if you're missing an ABA, like whatever it is, plug somebody else into that equation. And I promise you'll be more successful. Um, but then you need to look at where you're spending the majority of your time 
And if you were able to duplicate yourself in those capacities from the things you're not good at, or you don't like doing, and you just circle them, you, the, that's the first step. The second step, you need to figure out your hourly rate. And a lot of people are like, well, why? Well, it's very simple. Your mind is going to fight you on hiring somebody for the majority of you. Money is going to be in there somewhere. Right. And you're going to be sensitive to the fact, like, if I hire somebody, do I really have confidence? Even the really confident people are going to fight this a little bit. Do I really have the confidence that I'm going to make more money if I hire somebody, or am I just going to pay them their money, not make more money and flounder and not be profitable? Mm -hmm. That's what, that's the fear, right? So to pick which person you hire first to identify what the comp plan is and to know how to get over that, you have to start by creating the job responsibilities out of the things that you're not good at or you don't like. So for some of you, that might be if you already are doing a significant amount of online lead generation, and you're already really good at converting that. It might be hiring somebody who's an ISA blended with an admin, right? This is one of the hardest things when, when you're small is that you're not able to hire for one specific, specific specialized job. You're taking a couple different jobs that you're compensating that you don't want to do and you're blending them together, right? And then the job descriptions and the expectation settings become absolutely critical because if you hire somebody who's a really good ISA, but they're actually not good at the admin piece and you need them to do both, you have to be able to grow pretty quickly and then say, okay, this person is crushing it as an ISA. Now I'm going to hire a different admin and you have to keep scaling based on the same exercise you did for yourself with your people. Yeah. And yeah. that's how you know their growth path and what they want to do more of, right? So um, I don't think there's a one size fits all. I don't think there's one way to set up the comp plan. I do think a huge mistake, huge mistake people make is setting up the comp plan for a buyer's agent or a listing agent wrong from the beginning. And then if the person's successful, they don't know how to go back and fix that. Because what happens guys, if you just imagine the math for a second, if you're the team leader and you say, okay, Jeff, um, you're going to be on my team. I'm going to give you 50% of everything, right? And Jeff starts doing buy sides, then he starts doing list sides. Okay, you have a big problem because all of a sudden, if you're paying for all the transaction support, you're paying for all the marketing, you're paying for all the, the lead gen that makes the marketing successful, right? And you're already giving away 50% of the pie. Well, you don't have enough money to pay for all those other things to scale the team. And by the way, you're paying for the photography, the videography that's very expensive now, all these other things. So then you look around, you think, oh no, this team or that brokerage or this person is offering more value than I am. I need to keep hiring to be able to offer video services, or I need to keep hiring to be able to offer uh the, like in, in Corona, we all needed it. The floor plans that what I'm mad report, yeah. I need to add mad report to my listing process. Well, all of a sudden you're not making any money and you're not profitable. So you have to set up your comp plans correctly. We have an entire course on this at Hyperfast Academy guys that talks about how we do our comp plans and how we scale that. Because most team leaders, they, when they come to me, they're doing 200 transactions or something. And they say, and not everybody, some of the people that come to me have done zero transactions. I actually had someone join our program who said, I see what your coaching members are doing. She took an overnight flight from our hyperfast summit and joined the program and didn't have a real estate license yet. And she's like, look, I'm the kind of person I'm taking my test and I want to know exactly what to do once I take my test. And I'm like, this person is usually we don't let people who are not licensed join our program. And she called like four times and fought her way into the program. I'm like, I cannot wait to work with her. She's going to be amazing, right? We've had a couple of people that sold a company and decided to build a real estate team that joined our program. They have, it's like, we look at them and they say, I have zero transactions for last year and I want to do a hundred next year. So who do I need to hire to get there? Like, I love those people, but the majority of people, they're coming to me when they've already built something that is absolutely broken right? They, they are not making the money they need to make to sustain growth. And so then they're stuck where they don't have the money to invest in the resources the team needs. 
and their people are starting to leave and they're frustrated because they don't have the resources they need and it's a vicious cycle. They're like, oh, I've been working with this person for five years. This person's doing a ton of transactions and they're ready to leave because they want an assistant or they whatever they want and the structure doesn't allow it. Yeah. So a lot of what we do is help undo some of that and unwind it and keep their team members happy while adding ad additional services and just charging for them differently. Yeah, wow. So, okay, obviously, I think the way you described that is was very helpful because I think it's important for anybody who's thinking about this to know that if you are sitting here expecting Carrie to give you the answer, the answer does not exist because we're all different. This is not a one-size-fits-all business. So focus on and figure out, A, in my opinion, Carrie, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but especially when you're hiring in the very beginning, figure out which one of those pieces that you don't like or you're not good at, figure out which one is going to create the most ROI right out of the gate, because that probably will give you the the, the best peace of mind. So maybe it's not an assistant, because an assistant's just going to take stuff off your plate. Whereas somebody who can actually bring value through an ROI is probably if I was going to advise somebody, maybe I would focus on that because that's going to ease your, you know, your monetary mind uh, to know that, like she said, and I love the way she said that if after 90 days, there's not ROI, like break it down. If they're going to cost 40,000, can you afford 10 of it? All right. We'll focus on getting that first 10 to make money in the first 90 days. And then you alleviated that problem. I love that. That's, that was brilliant. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, Hey, Jeff, you yeah. asked me about the scale of my team. Yes. So that's something I should talk about. Um, going from a goal of a thousand transactions to give you guys perspective, what next year will look like uh, in order to hit 1.2 billion, we have to do 1,751 transactions. Okay. Not 1,750, not 1,700, 1,751. Yes. Based on our average price point. Right. So Imagine if you were trying to figure out a growth plan to hit that kind of growth. Okay. So going into this year, I had 80 people on my team approximately. Okay. And now I have about 115 on my team. So when you think about that 115 people, a lot of people are thinking 115 people divided by a thousand transactions, like that's that, that doesn't make sense. Right. Or, and, and here's the key, in my opinion, you have to have different departments to support the agents. So from an agent perspective, I probably had 45 agents going into this year and, and going into next year, I'll probably be closer to 75. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty massive amount. And we've brought on the majority of the, the growth happens in the end of the year for us from an agent count perspective, because we're already hiring to hit our goal for next year. So one of the things you have to think through as a team leader when you're doing your business plan for the year is your turnover. We have an 82% success rate when we hire an agent for keeping them. People are in the industry. You cannot plan on that, guys. You have to plan on 50-50. Yeah. That's just a safe number so that if you're trying to figure out what your average agent produces, how many transactions your average agent produces per month, when you're planning for your goal, you have to have that in mind and you have to bear in mind that some of your people are going to leave and they're not going to leave just because of you. So don't take it personally. Like I used to do this. So I'm just telling you, I'd be like, go through the list. Okay. If we're, if we're planning on you know, 25% of the people leaving, I'd go through the list and argue all the reasons why these people would never leave. I'd be like, well, we don't need to plan on that this year. Just, just plan on it. Go with your average in history and plan on that and hire with that in mind. And for me, it was things like that I'd be blindsided because somebody, I had one agent her first year in the business, she did 28 transactions and then her husband had a family emergency and they needed to move to care for his parents. Like I couldn't control that. But obviously if I had counted on her doing 34 transactions the next year or even 28, that would have created a hole in my business plan. So don't plan for people, plan for statistics. And when you're hiring, hire with that in mind. So some of you are wondering 115 people for the love of God, what do they do? 
right? How does that work? Mm -hmm. So when I evaluated my weaknesses, when I did the exercise I'm suggesting you guys do, one of my biggest weaknesses, which ironically was what my coach was telling me I had to do for the rest of my life, uh, was sitting down and making the follow-up calls. It's one thing to answer the phone. It's quite another thing. Well, and to be successful, you actually have to answer the phone the first time they're calling. And so what I thought of answering the phone then and what I think of it now, having I generate somewhere between 1,100 and 1,200 leads a week, okay? So when you think about the scale of my business now, I have 11 inside sales agents and I am hiring with like gusto to position myself to hit 1.2 billion next year. Mm -hmm. I know based on my numbers, which all of you should be studying your lead count, you should be studying the amount of time it takes for people to call back your leads. So you're setting your team up for success. I need 16 ISAs to do the full sequence of response to the leads I have incoming. That does not account for the amount of time it will take to follow up with all of my old leads. Mm. So I am really um, short on ISA staff even though it sounds like I have a lot of them, just purely based on statistics, okay? And one of the biggest challenges is getting the right data to do that analysis. I am the person who is always doing it on the back of a napkin. I now have somebody on my team that actually has a partner that's just dedicated to our database and our statistics and analyzing that. And so if I say, uh, which this year is the first time I said it, and ironically, it was during a summit. And so when our, our coaching students come, they get to watch us do a leadership meeting. That's one of the things they get to learn from. And I had asked the question of our analysis person, how many ISAs do we need to call back all the new leads? I'd never asked it that way. So when he did that analysis and came back with 16, and at that time I had eight, that was a semester ago, yeah. right? I was like, whoo, okay got it. I really need to focus on this. So have somebody that helps you with the numbers. Even if it's you right now, you need to assign time on your monthly calendar, on your weekly calendar to think about those numbers so that you're positioning yourself for success. And a lot of team leaders are generating leads and then they just don't have the capacity to follow up with them. And they're kicking themselves. Well, I promise you with our ISA structure, you would make more money by hiring an ISA and your ROI, my ROI on an ISA hire is, is already made back in 60 days. Mm -hmm. I already start being profitable for that hire. So when I'm gassing that, that hire and saying, okay, I'm going to hire five more, 10 more. I already know where my ROI is. And as long as I watch that, I shouldn't be afraid of hiring for that position because they're just going to create income in my company. Right. Yeah. Um, so I have a huge ISA department. Then the agents make up the next part. And then this is a key thing. Which is um, how many? The agent count right now is right around 60. I'd like to be at 70, 75 going into next year. Um, however, we already, we, we added what we call partner agents. We added six more partner agent teams. So that's when somebody on my team does 36 transactions in a year they get a partner that helps them accelerate their growth. The partner is very similar to what I described earlier with somebody that helps with the showings. They help with the marketing. They'll help with the admin. They are a highly, highly paid. They have a massive opportunity to make money. Partner, not an assistant, okay? They are not a showing agent. They are not an assistant. And understand if you are referring to someone that you want to be your partner as your assistant, or you are referring to them as a showing agent, they will never evolve into being a partner because no one will take them seriously and they will always want you. So that mindset of I'm the only one they want, I'm the only one who can do it. If you're not adjusting your language to treat them like a partner, you'll never, you'll never rise above that challenge that you're having. Mm -hmm. So it's about how you're handling it, not about them. Wow. I love it. That's, that's a strong mentality. Cause I think a lot of people probably make that mistake. Um, I, I was just thinking uh, as you were saying it, like, man, just tweak how you describe them or how you title them and it change. And you know what, probably for their own confidence too. 
right? I mean, that probably changes their, their, their uh, level of confidence to help them scale with you because they feel more vested than if they're just assisting you, right? Totally. That's, it becomes their business to grow, that's right? Impressive. And you're empowering them. So, and the, and the level of responsibility you give them when they're a partner and they prove that they can be trusted changes. So most of our partner agents We'll actually, within a few months, start negotiating some of the contracts. We'll start negotiating. If there's an appraisal issue, they'll step in. Like they are truly becoming a partner. And that takes our agents, just to give you perspective, guys, from 36 transactions to 54. So when you're thinking about the metrics, we imagine a three-month ramp up. And then we imagine that that partnership will be able to do two more per month than the agent was doing before. Interestingly enough, Last year, all of our partners, all of them are hitting above pace. They're six or seven above pace on that number, which tells us that the strength of the right partnership is massively successful and everyone makes more money. So whenever you're designing a comp plan, you need to look at the money to the team, the money to the lead agent and the money to the partnership and the partner agent and make sure that everybody makes more money than they're making now and everybody wins. And then we've taken it to the next level and now we have a mini team and that's when they bring on, those two agents bring on a partner. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a whole nother topic for another day, which is just <laughs> which is just figuring out the profitability and, and understanding making more with less. I think a lot of people get lost in that. Um, and I think you understand, I know you understand that. I know we understand that. And I know a lot of people don't understand that because they're greedy or they just can't get past the fact that it's just, the, the, well, I brought this, I built this, I should make, it doesn't work that way. It's just that you're not going to scale. Um, so no, and just to give you, just to give you a quick fact on that, um, my lead agent will likely net, not gross, net more than a million dollars next year. That's awesome. I'm super proud of that. Right. A lot of team leaders, I hear them saying things like this person's making too much money. Really? Is that because you, you set up their comp plan wrong? Or is that because what is that? What did you do wrong to create an environment where someone's making too much money? Or is it your mindset? Yeah. I'm thrilled that she's going to make over a million. If that doesn't motivate people to join my team, stay on my team, be interested in my team. Some of you are listening to this and you live in North Dakota or you live in Richmond, Virginia, and you're thinking, should I move to Arlington to work for Carrie? Probably because I'll help you make a shitload of money, right? Like I'm serious. I'm totally serious. Create a financial opportunity. People wonder why people stay with them. They get the training and they leave. Well, you're not creating an environment where they feel like they can make an unbelievable amount of money and keep growing. Yeah. So that is something that you need to shift in you. Yeah, a hundred percent. Well, and, and, and even then bring so much consistent value that your people will never, they don't have a reason to leave. They don't want to leave because this is a competitive business and you said it, turnover is inevitable. Uh, so minimizing the turnover is very important. Okay. So uh, if somebody joins your team from North Dakota, from this podcast, I am going to be just really stoked about that. That would be really <laughs> funny. Um, but, but in seriousness, so we, you left a gap. So we talked about, you talked about the ISAs, you talked about the agents um, that leaves about, if my math is correct, 25 or 30 more people. Yep. What are we have? Yeah. 25 janitors. I mean, what do you, what do you got going on there? Yeah, sure. So um, then we have a huge marketing department. And when, when people talk to me about my marketing department, their minds are blown, right? Because we had a conversation, Dan and I got to sit down with Gary V. This was about two years ago now. And what he taught us was about instead of competing with real estate agents, competing with the news, okay? And you guys have probably heard him talk about his be the mayor of your town strategy. His top example that I've heard him use is, if there's a pothole in the middle of the town and it pisses everybody off, do a story about the pothole. Because if you talk about what everybody else is thinking and talking about, then you become their source of news, right? So Dan and I were like, huh, okay. This makes a lot of sense to us. We're already number one in market share in, the, in, the, in sales volume in the DMV, which is Virginia, Maryland, and DC. So we have that whole kind of corridor. So 
how do we elevate our percentage of market share? And so instead of just having a marketing team like we used to, we went really hardcore into video. We started doing stories and this quadrupled our business in 90 days, guys, quadrupled. Okay. So some of you are like, oh yeah, but where's the ROI on that? I promise you there's an ROI on it. And it's a little harder to be able to track than it is to say, here's a postcard. They have the postcard in their hand. When I get there for the listing appointment, it paid off. Like it's a little different than that. Direct mail is tricky anyway, though, because they're calling, they're Googling you. It's still tricky, but it, it is, uh, it is something where you're becoming present in a lot of people's lives that are not yet looking to buy or sell. But guess what? When they decide to buy or sell, they think of you. So our marketing team right now, I want to say it has 12 to 14 people on it and they are hyper specialized. We have a graphic designer that is, is absolutely incredible. We have two copywriters. And if you guys communicate with me via email, you know, I'm super consistent. That is Dan. Dan is super consistent in working with our copywriters to make sure we're creating value. We stay in touch with the real estate agents in our community and we provide value to them. So some people, this is a slight caveat or a, what's it called when you, a tangent. This is a tangent and I'm gonna go on it anyway. Um, our open rate, for the, the real estate agents in our community is incredibly high. A lot of you can't get them to open anything, but they never know what they're gonna get from us, right? So we do events, we have one coming up that is just for people who want to do luxury real estate. It's in a $3 million listing. Instead of doing a broken broker's open, we're like, broker's opens are boring. People can go see the house on their own, right? Like, like they, don't, they don't need us for that. So we're doing a luxury mastermind where we're talking about how the people that are at the top of the market by invitation only are generating high-end listings and then some of the techniques to get them sold. Now, everybody in our market, we will pick a few top people that'll be leading, facilitating the conversation that everybody wants to hear from. Yeah. The last time we did an event like this, we planned it. We sent out an invite 10 days before the event. We had over 200 people RSVP for the event and we're like, whoa, okay, we don't have that much space. What are we going to do, right? So the way that you communicate with people matters. That's why we have two copywriters. Some of you are like, what? What would a copywriter do? Then we have someone who just focuses on um, the websites and the click funnels. So there, I think his title, this is how much I know about it. I don't run this. We have a director of marketing that runs this. Mm -hmm. But it's a web designer, I believe is his title. And his whole focus is our landing pages. So some of you are wondering, well, if I put the ad that Carrie has, she told me to copy her and I did, I put the ad and it didn't work. Well, did you click on my ad to see what landing page it went to? Cause you've got to copy the landing page too, to make it work, right? So everything all the way through is a process. Um, then we have a digital marketing specialist that just is doing our ads right? And managing our ad accounts. And he's constantly optimizing and studying. And so it's a very, very specialized department. If you look at Remax corporate, Long and Foster corporate, Keller Williams corporate, I probably have more people working in my marketing department than most of these huge corporate entities. Okay. But we're very specialized and we're focused on building relationships with people in our community that aren't looking to buy or sell yet. That's part of our success, yeah. right? Then the rest of our team, we have three people that are in HR and recruiting. Recruiting is a massive focus for us and it takes a lot of time and it, you have to be very aware. Then recently we just added a trainer. She's responsible for helping our sales manager onboard and train our people and then have ongoing training. So we're huge on training because we want our agents to be ninjas. We want them to be really, really good at what they do. And part of that is understanding technical things like different lending programs that can change the game, right? Mm -hmm. Like for us, people always talk about, oh, this loan program or that loan program, but they don't understand how to apply it to the individual client. So that's something we're working on with Jeff. Like how do we give them the right training to make them problem solvers instantly? Yeah. And, and there's a massive opportunity there. If your agents cannot run the payment in the field to help un, under, someone understand, okay, if I spend $250 more a month, 
here's what I'm going to get. Or if I save $250 a month, here's what I'm going to get. If they can't have those money conversations on a monthly basis, how the client thinks about money, you're, you are not handling that right. And those of you who are saying, oh, I need to let the lender do that. That's the lender's job. Bullshit. If you do it and you get good at it, you will close a shitload more deals, period. That's interesting. Uh, Cause I was thinking that too. I was thinking that is going to be the objection, which is stay out of you know, I, I don't try to advise people on what house they should buy or comps. So why are you getting involved? But I think I, I know that I know you well enough to know that I don't think you're trying to teach your agents how to do the loan officer's job. You're teaching them to be eloquent enough to have the conversation so they don't just have. So when they're in the moment, they can engage. And not only that, you look like more of the professional rather than, well, let me have you talk to my lender. Well, it's Sunday. You probably aren't going to get old until Monday. And then you just have a pause. Am I correct? And Absolutely. And we believe in doing a process upfront called the reality check analysis. If you have not learned about that, guys, I promise you it's going to help you make more money and save a ton of time. Um, but what we're doing is setting the expectation for the client on the market. And part of doing that, we call it the circle of truth, but it's shifting the client's expectations. We love to have the lender talk to the client right before we do that exercise. But I promise you, if the lender doesn't answer their phone, my staff is tested on their ability to give those numbers live by using a mortgage calculator. And they're saying, hey, and they're also trained to be able to show the difference, we imagine for every $10,000 in the price that the person spends, it comes out to about $45 in the monthly payment. So what happens if you're going to look at what the, the client's needs are and you're going to look at it in the MLS and zero come up, if you have to say, okay, well, there's nothing available, but go talk to my lender tonight and then we'll give you a call tomorrow and we'll figure it out. Like if I'm that person, I'm like, you suck at solving problems. And like, I feel deflated and not good after our meeting, which if they come down the street and meet with me, I promise they'll leave the meeting feeling different than how they left with you. Mm -hmm. So you've got to get better at this. This is not something to take lightly. It's a big deal. And when you're standing in the house and the house is $20,000 more than what they wanted to spend, but they love it. You don't know how to close them if you don't know how to talk about what that $20,000 means because $20,000 sounds like so much money in their mind. But when you say, hey, listen, are you willing to, to spend $100 more a month? It's even a little less than that. Is that something you would be comfortable with to get? And then you go through all the things they get in the house. What are they going to say? Yeah. Yes. They're going to say yes, but you're not positioning it that way. That's why you're not closing as many deals. So you have to work on your skills part of your skills. When I was selling new homes, I, I mean, someone might not come into my model for a week. If they came in there, I was not letting them leave. I would order breakfast, lunch, and dinner if it kept them there until they signed the contract. I had to do their front end and back end ratios and I had to make sure they were approved. Otherwise, guess what happened? I spent my whole time writing the contract. I submitted it. When they went to get their pre-approval, they weren't pre-approved and I wasted my time. Yeah. Right. That's so incredible. super, super important. That's incredible. And, and I know we're running short on time, so I want to wrap this up. Uh, and this has just been to me, I, I'm, I'm obviously kind of absorbing it all. That's my, I, I get, the, I, I'm the lucky one who gets to do these interviews. I know if I'm sitting here listening to this, I mean, you just got teased really hard. Like you're like, damn it. I need more of this, or I need more of that. We didn't even really get to the coaching platform or the event piece of this. Uh, but uh, there is a way to get it. And Carrie mentioned it, uh, whether you're an agent, whether you're a team lead, I mean, all this stuff you learned today, if you want to learn from Carrie, if you want to learn from Dan, which by the way, Dan is absolutely brilliant. They make such a power couple. Um, you know, this is what Hyperfast was created for. So give our listener uh, kind of where can they go? Where can they find you guys? If they're interested in learning more, where should they, where should they find you? Well, one of the things we didn't talk about too today is just having work-life balance because a lot of agents that are successful that have mastered some of the things I'm talking about are like, yes, I've mastered that, Carrie, but I'm struggling. I'm not there for my family. I'm, I'm stepping out of my four-year-old's birthday party and missing this amazing event because I have a contract and I got to process it, right? So I created uh, tips for you on that. And it's a video you can watch that's a little bit deeper on how to create. It's the top five things that I do to create work-life balance. So that's Carrie's, no apostrophe, just Carrie with an S, 
five tips.com. If you guys want to go check that out, that's absolutely free. If you're interested in signing up for coaching and some people are like, okay, I've heard hold, enough. Hold on I'm one in- second. Five spelled out or the number five? Oh, the number five. Okay. Perfect. Carrie's five tips. Perfect. Yes. Um, then please, by all means, grab that. But if you're interested in coaching and you want to learn more about that, if you go to our hyperfast website, it's just hyperfastagent.com. Um, there's a lot of information on there and I'm everywhere on social. It's easy to find me. Um, so if you want to send me a message on LinkedIn or connect on Instagram uh, or Facebook, I would love that. Um, so yeah, I just, I'm obsessed with this. I live and breathe it. And I'm obsessed with people growing their real estate businesses and being happier in their life. So it's really fun for me. I love it. And and I am the fortunate one who gets to spend more and more time with you. So I am really excited to have many, many more of these conversations because I geek out on this stuff. So when Carrie and I get together at the bar and we're the last ones there, I promise you, we are going to be talking about data and strategies and analytics and all this crazy stuff because that's fun. And uh, I tell you what, folks, I've, I've had, again, I had the pleasure of getting to know Carrie over the last couple of years. If you don't follow her, at the very least, you are absolutely missing out. Uh, she just gave you all, good places to go. Carrie's, the number five, tips.com. Check that out for work-life balance. Go to hyperfast, hyperfastagent.com. That's H-Y-P-E-R, fastagent.com. Uh, go check out what they've got going on there. The event that she did, uh, well, as, as of this recording, it was last week. Uh, but the event they did there, they do four different events per year for their coaching clients, like deep dive masterminding. Um, this is powerful, powerful stuff. Carrie, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I will probably talk to you later today. And <laughs> I hope uh, I look forward to it. I look forward to what we have coming going forward. And uh, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. I'll talk to you all soon. Sounds good. Have a good doctor's appointment. Uh, take care of that Thank baby. You. <laughs> Semester three. Oh, it's exciting stuff. <laughs> all right. Bye, Jeff. Bye-bye. Welcome Agents Podcast.